and linguistics to, to get a more uh, complete view of, of our history as a species. So um, already uh, using genetics as, as a tool to look at human history, we've learned quite a lot about humans, uh, where humans originated and how they spread uh, across the earth. Uh, so this picture here is from an evolutionary genetics textbook, and it's already a bit uh, dated, um, uh, about almost 10 years ago. But here you can see that we know now quite confidently, because of genetic studies, that humans originated recently in on the African continent. And then around 60,000 years ago, a group of humans left Africa and they populated the rest of the world. Also, thanks to genetics, we know that this human group that left Africa and migrated into Eurasia mixed with archaic humans. Um, and as Stefano mentioned, um, this is quite uh, current news that uh, uh, this topic, because Van der Pebu has received the Nobel Prize for for this discovery of that our ancestors that left, left Africa around 60,000 years ago actually mixed with these archaic humans uh, present on, on uh, the Eurasian continent. And this was not sure before genetic studies whether this mixture happened or not. Um, and using genetic studies and we the genetics community was a fo a fortunate enough to generate um, uh, genomes for these archaic individuals. So they were genetically sequenced, Neanderthals and Denisovans. And because of this genetic sequence we obtained from them, we could identify uh, that they mixed with, with our ancestors migrating out of Africa. So we are learning more and more about human migrations. This is a bit of an up updated um, picture uh, showing different human migrations across the earth. And you can see the picture is getting much more complicated, especially for this region in Eurasia, where we are learning a lot now about the expansions that went along with, with the um, movement of farmers and herders. Uh, in the last 10,000 years, farmers and herders moved quite a lot uh, in the different continent. And especially ancient DNA studies are contributing a lot to resolving this picture um, and already have contributed a lot uh, to infer the history of the European continent. And we know now about the large migrations of our first farmers and after that herders that spread from different parts um, of the Eurasian continent into Europe and, and also brought those practices, those cultural practices with them and introduced it into Europe. And from this uh, picture here, it, it looks as if not so much is known for the African continent, it looked very sort of um, non-defined in, in both the tree year and, and, and the, the sort of migration routes here. But actually we are learning more and more, uh, again, using a genetics as a tool about Africa and the genetic structure of African populations. Um, and uh, you will see as I go along through the presentation, I will show the pictures of the various students that worked on these projects. So this specific uh, paper that we did in, in 2020 was a review paper where we looked at African history um, based on modern and ancient DNA, basically what this talk is about. But we also reanalyzed uh, during this, this uh, review all of the ancient DNA data that was available up to that stage. So what we found in this review is that we saw that Africa uh, before and after uh, the, the start of the Holocene uh, is quite different, the genetic sort of um, relationships between, between groups. So if you look at these time periods, um, uh, deeper African history, it seems that there were a lot of different hunter-gatherer groups living across the landscape, and they were related to each other in, in gradients. They don't seem to have moved a lot, but it seems that uh, they had interaction with their neighboring groups, and there's these large gradients of migration across the African uh, continent. And this we can study using uh, the few remaining hunter-gatherer groups that we have in Africa, like the Khoisan, or the rainforest hunter-gatherers, previously known as pygmy groups. And there's also a few East African hunter-gatherers um, group left. So by looking at the genomes of these remaining hunter-gatherer groups, we can access this deeper history of Africa. And then also ancient DNA can give us access 
to even parts of this region that we don't have any uh, current day hunter gatherer groups left, for instance. And in this region between the Khoisan and East African hunter gatherers, we know about this gradient now because people found ancient genomes in this region and they saw that the ancient genomes were basically in between Khoisan genetic variation and East African hunter gatherer genetic variation. So this these, these gradients then. Um, uh, existed over the African landscape before the Holocene. So different hunter-gatherer groups related to each other in a kind of stepwise fashion. But then um, with the Holocene came uh, the development of farming practices and populations began to move much more. And certain populations adopted herding and farming practices and they expanded uh, across the African continent and they replaced these pre-existing hunter-gatherer groups uh, basically with, with their genetics and their culture. Um, and here you can see many of these large Holocene movements indicated with the years, more or less, when they started and ended. One of the largest Holocene migrations probably in the world was the migration of Bantu-speaking groups from a small region in West Africa to the rest of sub-equatorial Africa, so that today um, the majority of all of the populations in sub-equatorial Africa are, are uh, Bantu speakers. So from this small region in, in, in West Africa, they expanded um, and replaced hunter-gatherer populations in all of these countries here. And today they are the majority populations. Um, but all of these expansions shown here, I'm going to highlight one each of them a little bit, um, is is quite complex, and we learn more and more that it's it's it, there might have been a complex movement underlying them, and for that ancient DNA is also needed to resolve this complexity that we see in migrations of humans. So first, I will talk a bit about the uh, African history before farming, and then I will. So this is our deeper history, and this is. Uh, basically all human history, uh, because it is before, uh, it goes to before the out of Africa migration. And then I will talk a bit more about these um, uh, migrations in the last 12,000 years or so. So with regards to ancient DNA in Africa, it's a relatively young field uh, because ancient DNA studies uh, at least genome-wide ancient DNA studies only took off uh, in the last one and a half decades that people were able to, to generate genome-wide ancient DNA. And Africa even started later. The first study was only published in 2015. And this is because conditions in Africa are not so favorable for the preservation of DNA in, in ancient material like bones and teeth and so on. Uh, the DNA, because of the warmer and sometimes humid conditions, the DNA break down more easily in Africa, for example, compared to Europe. Uh, but um, studies are getting more and more, and, and these are the studies uh, that I list here that are available for genome-wide studies in, in sub-Saharan Africa and in North Africa. And I list them separately here because, uh, as you will see later on, North Africa, the genetics of North African people are, look quite different um, from sub-Saharan Africa. North Africans are much more similar to uh, Middle East and, and, and the Eurasian populations uh, compared to sub-Saharan Africa. So again, to this review that we did uh, in 2020. So in this review, we analyzed all of these groups in is showed in this picture. And uh, the circles are the modern day groups we included and the uh, diamonds with the borders are the ancient DNA uh, studies that were ab available up until that date. And we analyzed this data together. Um, and here we sh show a principal component analysis. Um, I guess most of you are familiar with this, but what it is is basically uh, a representation of genetic variation of the genetic variation that we see in these populations and ancient DNA individuals in two dimensions. And what we've seen from, from other studies and so on, um, just because of the way that people move and interact many times, if you visualize uh, genetic structure in, in two dimensions with these PCAs, there is some correlation to geography, um, just because people living close to each other usually have offspring with each other. So genetic variation usually have some correlation um, with geography, um, and that correlation is stronger if if there were not really large migrations in in the recent 
uh, uh, history of populations. Um, so this first principal component is just, it's all modern day and ancient individuals in Africa. And when we correlate uh, this PCA uh, plot to geography, we see there's around 30% uh, correlation and it is significant. So there is a significant correlation between genetic space and geography space um, when doing a principal component analysis of all the modern day uh, uh, ancient individuals in Africa. Um, but uh, just by looking at this PCI compared to the map here where the people are living, you can see, for instance, this gray cluster here, which is a West African cluster. Um, although it, there are this West African component in, in West Africa, it seems that this West African uh, cluster is also present in East Africa and it's also present in Southern Africa. And this is because of this Bantu expansion that I mentioned before, that people expanded out of West Africa to the rest of the continent. And therefore, the genetic variation is basically West African genetic variation. It's similar to groups uh, from Nigeria, such as the Yoruba and so on. Um, but today, when, when you look at where they live, they live all across sub-equatorial -equ Africa. So this principal component, uh, even though there were these large movements of people recent in times, um, there, there's still a correlation with geography, and we see East Africans basically in, in the East, West Africans in the West, and Southern Africans, for instance, Khoisan groups and so on in, in the Southern part of the continent. However, if you only do this principal component analysis, only including hunter-gatherer groups and also uh, ancient DNA individuals that were obtained from a hunter-gatherer context, um, because some of these ancient DNA individuals were obtained from farmer context, so they were already farmers. But if you only take the hunter-gatherer ancient DNA individuals and only modern day um, Khoisan uh, and West African and East African hunter-gatherers, you see that the correlation to geography is increasing to uh, over 70%. So this again sort of indicates that there were these gradients on the landscape if you consider uh, the remaining hunter-gatherer variation and um, also hunter-gatherer variation from the past. Uh, there's just a few other plots um, basically showing the same thing. Here is uh, the PCI plot again showed in the previous figure. Here's a multi-dimensional scaling plot. Um, that's a similar procedure and reducing genetic variation. Again, high correlation to geography. And here is if you only use the ancient DNA individuals and you exclude modern day hunter gatherer groups, again, high correlation to geography. Uh, in these bottom plots, uh, we have allele sharing statistics or F3 statistics. And what we did here is from each part of Africa, we took one of the ancient DNA individuals and we compare how much allele sharing they have with other uh, ancient DNA and modern DNA individuals across Africa. Um, here we took the uh, South African ancient DNA individual from Balito Bay uh, that we sequenced a few years ago. And we compare it to other Africans and we can see there is this gradient uh, of allele sharing um, with other African groups. It's uh, this Polito by individual shares most of their alleles with Southern African groups, more with East African and then the least with West African individuals. Um, the same happens when we take an East African hunter-gatherer. Uh, you see these gradients over the landscape of allele sharing. And here we took a uh, Shumlaka, a uh, 3000 year old um, ancient DNA individual from West Africa. And again, you see this a gradient pattern of allele sharing across the African continent. Um, so these are just different analysis supporting this uh, fact that we see these gradient of genetic relationships of hunter-gatherer groups. Uh, another way of representing it and analyzing it is in the format of a tree. Um, and this is this article it was the article um, we wrote when we uh, published this ancient DNA individual from Belito Bay, a 2000 year old uh, individual that are related to Khoisan individuals of today. Um, uh, and in this publication, we generated this coalescent tree. Um, so we estimated the split dates between uh, the major population as clusters in on, uh, across the African continent. And we estimated when these populations diverge from each other using these coalescent approaches. Um, and then we came up with this tree. Uh, 
Um, and what we saw is uh, if we look at genetic variation across the African continent, we see that the first split in the tree is between Khoisan populations from Southern Africa and basically the rest of humanity. Uh, then we see a split of the rainforest hunter-gatherer groups uh, with the other groups. And then we see a split between West Africans and East Africans. Uh, and then we have the out of Africa migrations of humans. There's a bottleneck. A lot of genetic variation is lost in this bottleneck. And then populations expand across the world and basically form uh, Eurasian populations of today. But what this picture aims to illustrate is that um, even before the out of Africa migrations of, of Eurasian and American people uh, of today, even before this out of Africa migration, there is a lot of genetic substructure already pro, uh, present in African populations. And this illustrates the high genetic diversities that we see in African populations um, uh, uh, compared to non-African populations before, because we have these deep divergences among Afri African populations already before the out of Africa migration. Um, and as you see, uh, basically this gradient that we see in the PCA is, is replicated by this tree because the groups least related to each other are also located the furthest from each other on geographic space. So again, indicating that geography plays a role in this deep structure that we see uh, in, uh, between African uh, populations. Um, some of you might be familiar with this type of analysis. It's called admixture or population structure analysis. And it's basically a clustering approach where you cluster populations in, in genetic clusters. Um, and, and when you run this clustering approaches, you don't tell the software anything about where the populations, where the individuals come from or which um, populations they belong to. Uh, you just give a, a certain number of clusters and tell the software to cluster uh, genetic variation in these number of clusters. So in this case, we cluster genetic variation in uh, uh, five clusters. Uh, we said uh, the program should cluster genetic variation into five clusters. And then what the program does is optimally divide genetic variation into five clusters maximizing the genetic differences between these five different clusters. And when we, you do this type of clustering analysis, uh, you get this type of plot. It's basically a bar plot and all of these uh, small lines in these plots are individuals. Uh, and these different colors is basically a bar plot of the genetic variation of each individual uh, representing res represented in this plot. Um, and this individual then belongs to a certain number of these clusters uh, that the program identified. And you can see that some of the clusters are almost uh, completely uh, full here. Uh, this is a completely red cluster. This is a completely green cluster. This is a completely blue cluster. This is a completely brown cluster. So these individuals belong to these clusters and they don't have evidence of any gene flow coming from uh, some of the other clusters uh, into their populations. But some populations have evidence of, of belonging to other clusters. And you see it um, in, in, in the fact that there are these contributions from other clusters into these uh, populations. And this is because of, of admixture that these uh, they were gene flow between different populations. And many of these gene flow events actually happened in the last 10,000 years due to the Holocene migration of farmers. And here you see, um, for instance, the West African with the Bantu expansion, uh, that individuals spread and basically mixed into many of these different populations into the rainforest hunter-gatherers and into the Khoisan individuals because of this uh, last migration. And you can also date these admixture events. Uh, and usually they are quite recent in time when you date them. But then in the genetic variation, of African populations, we then see that Southern African variation is uh, associated with Khoisan hunter-gatherers, rainforest hunter-gatherers uh, represent Central African um, variation, and then we have the East and West African genetic variation uh, also splitting from each other more recent in time. Um, but going back to this tree now, uh, when we look at a tree like this, um, I want to discuss a bit on, on what it means when we have a population tree like this, because this is a, 
a tree representing the splits in different populations. Um, and and uh, what is underlying this tree is, is a lot of data from the whole genome. Uh, so actually it's not just one tree of, of a, say one locus splitting and uh, uh, through time. Um, there's a lot of single trees uh, underlying a phylogeny like this. And um, it, this is actually just the average population tree uh, showing the average relatedness of different populations to each other across the landscape. Uh, and to really understand how this works, um, I usually show uh, this, this uh, illustration here. For instance, um, mitochondrial DNA, as you all would know, is inherited from uh, mothers to, to their children and only the daughters pass it on, but it, it doesn't undergo any recombination. It is inherited intact. So it's basically one locus. And uh, if you look at mitochondrial DNA and there's variation present in the mitochondrial DNA molecule, all of that is because of mutations that accumulate in a stepwise fashion. So you can easily build the tree from all of the mitochondria of people living today. And when you do a, a build a mitochondrial DNA and you come to a most recent common ancestor of all of the different lineages circulating in the world today, um, that means that that individual that, that carried that mitochondrial DNA molecule were our uh, single mitochondrial ancestor, sometimes called mitochondrial Eve. And when you date, um, when uh, all of these lineages coalesce, it's around 200,000 years ago. Um, and when you look at the diversity patterns of these early diverging lineages, you can predict more or less where this individual, this mitochondrial Eve lived. She, li she lived in Southern or Eastern Africa in that gradient. Um, uh, and she lived around 200,000 years ago. The single individual that gave rise to all of the mitochondria on Earth today. The same you can do with Y chromosomes. Y chromosomes are inherited from father to son. They don't recombine, or the largest part don't recombine. Uh, and you can build a one single phylogeny, and you can date when the Y chromosome Adam lived, or the individual that gave rise to all of the Y chromosomes on Earth today. And that ancestor lived around 400,000 years ago in, in West Africa. So now we have two ancestors from two parts of our genome. One lived 400,000 years in West Africa, other one lived 200,000 years ago in Southern Africa. Um, but it's the, the, y, the mitochondria and the Y chromosome is very small parts of our genome. It's only a 16,000 base pairs for the mitochondria and around 60 million base pairs for the Y chromosome. Then we have all of our other chromosomes that are 3 billion base pairs. And then all of these other chromosomes, uh, basically all of the pieces on them is representative of our other ancestors that lived together with mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam on the African continent. So they didn't live alone. There were a lot of people living together with them in the different places in Africa. And although those individuals were not... Um, we're not, we're not contributing to our mitochondria and our Y chromosome today, they likely have contributed to our autosomes or our other chromosomes. Uh, and uh, it is difficult to analyze these other chromosomes because they are not single loci like the mitochondria and the Y chromosome. You cannot build, say you take chromosome one and you want to build a tree from it, you cannot do it like that because uh, the different chromosomes recombine every generation uh, and they exchange uh, parts with, with, with each other. So what you will, will get is basically a puzzle or a, a patchwork of, of different recombined chromosomes uh, across the, the different generations. So you cannot build these single phylogenies for the different chromosomes. There are other methods that one needs to use to look at all of the variation on these different chromosomes. But you cannot also ignore these, these, this variation because it is important and it represents our other ancestors. So what the study many studies many times do is that, for instance, this program here, it chops up the chromosomes in small parts and then it makes many different small phylogenies uh, and combine these different small phylogenies into a single population tree. And this is also what we did in this study. 
Um, we, we made all of these single phylogenies of different loci across the genome. You combine it into a single population tree, and then you can see um, when the different populations split from each other. But it's very important to, to, to remember that a tree like this uh, is just representative of a lot of underlying uh, different coalescence trees. And these smaller trees could have different ancestors in different parts of Africa. So although it might look if it, go, if it combines into a single population here, it doesn't really mean that this was a single population that lived in a single place in Africa and a single time period. Rather, it's just sort of an average representation of how different populations are related to each other. And all of the different under phylog underlying phylogenies to this uh, group uh, topology um, will have different ancestors uh, in the different uh, parts of the African continent. So a model like this uh, called the isolation by distance model, this type of model can also underlie a coalescence population tree like this. Uh, and in this model, we have many different populations living across the African landscape. And these populations have stepwise gene flow with each other. So in the end, the population living in Southern Africa will be the least related to the population living in Northeastern Africa, just because it is the furthest geographically separated from the, the population uh, that lives the furthest from it. So this isolation by distance model with many populations living across the African landscape, only having stepwise gene flow from its, each other, is also a likely model uh, that could explain the deep history of populations in Africa. So in, in this case, it might look like there are several separate sort of origins of humans uh, across the African landscape. Another discipline that really investigates this question uh, regarding human origins on the African continent is also paleoanthropology. Um, so the study of, of different kinds of fossils uh, across the African continent and when you look at um, the time period of 700,000 years ago to present and the different fossils that we find, find across the African continent in the northeast and southern parts of, of Africa, we see that there is a gradient where uh, humans seems to uh, uh, evolve from our very morphologically very archaic looking humans to um, modern uh, looking humans. So if you just compare the morphology of the different groups and you see how the morphology is changing, it seems there's a gradient, not in one place in Africa, but in several places in Africa, where humans evolve from archaic looking humans into modern looking humans. And in this time period, this interesting time period where populations began to diverge from each other genetically, that's around 300,000 years ago, um, we see that we the different humans living in the different parts of Africa around 300 years, uh, 300,000 years ago, uh, show a morphology that's in between archaic and modern looking humans. So these humans are called transitional humans. Um, and there, this Flores Batska from South Africa, Yebel Irut from Morocco, um, and also the Omo and Arto skeletons uh, from Ethiopia is uh, examples of these humans uh, starting uh, to lose their archaic uh, futures and becoming completely modern looking. But the important thing is that this is happening in different places in the African continent and not just in one place. So more and more in the paleoanthropology community, people are also uh, talking about the pan-African origin of Homo sapiens and not just one place where humans originate. Um, and this is a question then that many studies, um, many geneticists, together with paleoanthropologists are asking together, is that our species evolve in subdivided populations across Africa? And why does it matter? This is another very interesting uh, review of, of different opinions um, and different studies. Uh, and this is also written by paleoanthropologists and by geneticists together. Uh, and they reviewed the different models of human origins on the African continent. Um, and uh, here they have a single origin model where po one population expand and uh, they replace all of the preceding African populations. Then um, there's this longstanding pan-African connectivity that is basically the isolation by distance uh, model that I showed you now. And it's basically the stepwise uh, gene flow between different populations. 
And then we also have a sort of intermediate model where we have uh, that there are many populations across the African continent, but one of these populations expand and mix with these other populations. So these are all possible models of, of human origins in Africa. But what the study concluded is that they can probably re reject the single origin model. Um, it doesn't look like the genetic evidence or the paleoanthropology evidence really find support that there was uh, just the origin in a single place in Africa of humans, and then they replaced all of the other humans. But also something very interesting that they note is this uh, archaic admixture, because this is also a question that have, people have thought about a lot, especially for African populations as well, whether, um, like we saw for the non-African populations with Neanderthal and Denisova, there was admixture, whether there is a possibility or there was a possibility in Africa that um, more modern looking humans maybe admix with more archaic humans that split from modern human populations much further back in time. For instance, Neanderthals split from us around 600,000 years ago. And then when we met them again around 60,000 years ago, they mixed back into us. So was there a, a possibility that this also happened in Africa? And several genetic studies now actually have found uh, in modern day genomes that there might be evidence of, of this uh, archaic integration of basically lineages in, in our genomes uh, or in the genomes of the different African populations today um, that look like if they diverge much deeper in time. Uh, and here is just uh, uh, some of these studies um, that uh, to, to be able to make their data fit, they needed to include this archaic populations, these ghost populations, populations that we don't necessarily today exist as distinct populations, but we see still see their genetic contributions in the genomes of Africans today. Uh, in this study, we had um, to have this basal human uh, population, had to introduce this basal human population that contributes to West African genomes. Um, this uh, study over here, um, ghost archaic introduction, introgression in African populations was also uh, found in West African populations. Many of these uh, studies point to that there might be possible evidence in the genetics that there was some kind of archaic introgression uh, in African genomes. But it's very unclear um, whether this uh, can be supported or not. And we actually see this um, in genetic studies uh, for Neanderthals and Denisova. Before we had the Denisovan and Neanderthal genomes, there were also many genetic studies that detected this possibility of archaic admixture, but they couldn't really say whether Denisova or Neanderthal admixed into non-Africans. It was only when the genomes were sequenced of these archaic individuals that uh, people could say, yes, Neanderthal and Denisova admixed with, with uh, Eurasian people. Now with Africa, we have the same problem. We see this evidence that there might have been archaic integration, but we, we don't have any genomes of these possible archaic uh, African individuals. Uh, and when we just look at the, um, the paleoanthropology record, I've talked about this interesting time period when populations started to di diverge. And in the different parts of Africa, we have these transitional humans living in the different parts. Um, uh, so all of these humans were evolving into modern forms. None of them were looking very much more archaic uh, compared to each other. Flores Pat in South Africa, Yebel Irut in Morocco, and the Omo Nato fossils in Ethiopia all look like these transitional humans, more or less, um, that they could belong to the same species. But then together with these transitional humans, there were also forms of humans that lived on the African continent that were much more archaic looking uh, than these examples. For instance, in the time period that the Flores Bat uh, population lived in Southern Africa, this transitional human, in the same time period and also the same geographic space also lived um, this population or the species called Homo naledi. Uh, they were much more archaic looking um, than the population that's represented by Flores. But you can see they almost have no forehead. They have very pronounced brow ridges, very protrude, protruding bottom part of the face. 
these are all characteristics of uh, archaic humans. And clearly it is very different um, from this uh, population that, that occupied the same time and space as this population. So the question is, uh, did they mix with each other or not? Many paleoanthropologists believe just based on morphology that these populations were too different from each other to mix with each other. But then we also, when we look at other parts of Africa, there were uh, uh, populations that were even closer to us that still have much more archaic um, looking uh, uh, morphology compared to us. So um, in, in uh, at Bro uh, Broken Hill uh, or Kapwe in, in Zambia, we have this um, Kapwe skull. Uh, and you can see that they are also looking more archaic, not as archaic as Homo naledi, but much more archaic than contemporary sort of transitional human uh, populations that lived with it, together with it on the landscape. Uh, but then again, when we ask whether these two populations mix with each other, the question is a bit less clear. Uh, with Homo naledi, maybe we, we could say they were too different. But these ones, uh, they were classified as Homo idolbergensis, potentially. And Homo idolbergensis were the ancestors of Neanderthals. And Neanderthals mixed with us. So there is definitely a possibility that these um, individuals could have admixed with each other. Um, on the African landscape in that time period. Also, even more recent in time, we have evidence of uh, fossils with archaic futures living in West Africa uh, at the site of Ivo Ileru. Um, and they were not as archaic as the broken eel or the Capwe skull, but they still have some archaic futures that is more archaic uh, than contemporary human populations. And this is only around 13, 15,000 years ago and that these uh, humans lived together with more modern looking humans. So again, a possibility of, of archaic admixture. However, it's, it's most possible that we, to really say whether there is archaic admixture in African populations, that we will need to generate genomes from these archaic individuals. Uh, I now want to quickly talk about some of these Holocene migrations. I see I've used up uh, quite a lot of my time uh, talking about um, uh, uh, deeper East in Africa, but I'm just quickly going to mention what we've learned about these uh, more recent in time migrations on the African continent. Uh, and these uh, are the migrations that gave rise to all of these evidences of admixture in the genomes of current day Africans. The first is uh, ancient back to Africa migrations. Um, and we know now from ancient DNA studies, uh, 15,000 year old from Morocco, individual from Morocco was sequenced using ancient DNA techniques. Uh, this individual was called Tafurat, uh, shown here in the PCA plot. And we see that it clustered between African genetic variation and variation found in non-African uh, individuals. Um, and when you see this, kind of bar plot of the Tafarad individual, you see that half of its genome comes from non-African variation and the other half from African variation. And this African variation is divided in equal parts between West African and East African variation. So what we know from the Tafarad individual is that this migration, back migration into Africa happened already before 15,000 years ago because there is already non, half of its genome, half of this individual's genome is already uh, non-African um, at this time period. So the back migrations into Northeast Africa must have happened 15,000 years, be, before 15,000 years ago. But there were also quite a few more recent in time back migrations into Africa, especially in Northeast Africa. Uh, in this study that we published recently, um, we uh, estimated different admixture dates in the different populations from Northeast Africa. And this is the distribution of the admixture dates according to language family in Northeast Africa, showing that uh, the admixture dates is not really clustered. Um, it is, it's a complex uh, admixture history in Northeast Africa. Some admixture comes from Levant, the Levant region, especially in the Northern parts of Africa. But the admixture more in the Horn of Africa come from uh, the Arabian Peninsula, rather. 
Um, but there isn't like a distinct uh, sort of back migration into Northeast Africa. Rather, it's spread in time and it seems to have been a complex process of back migration into Northeast Africa. Um, there is also studies uh, on how the first migrations into Northeast Africa happened uh, together with the introduction of herding practices. Um, and I'm not going to re uh, review this in detail, but this is a study you can look at uh, from Prendergast et al, where they look at basically looking at ancient DNA, how the first processes of uh, migration uh, into Northeast Africa happened uh, together with the uh, introduction of herding. Um, but then there was also, um, once these herder groups um, originated in, in Northeast Africa, there was also a migration of these groups um, with their herding practices to Southern Africa, and this is this arrow here. Um, and uh, this migration of basically Northeast African variation together with non-African variation introduced East African and non-African variation into populations of Southern Africa. And this gave rise to the Khoi Khoi populations of Southern Africa. They were herding populations um, and they were related to San populations, but uh, they had an extra contribution from Northeast Africa in their genomes. And this was also shown by an ancient DNA studies um, uh, that sequence individuals from 2000 years old and from a bit more recent, from 1200 years old. And when you look at the 2000 year old and the 1200 year old individual, you can see that old individuals that were lived around 2000 years ago in South, South Africa uh, were completely belonging to this red cluster, which is a sun cluster, sun associated cluster. And then around 1,200 years ago, there was this additional contribution um, that were carried by the East African herder populations. And half of this contribution were actually uh, North African or non-African contribution, and half of it was a local East African contribution. So East African and non-African variation was already introduced into Southern African population even before the time of, of colonization, around 1,200 years ago. And this is the herding uh, sort of expansion into Southern Africa that gave rise to the Khoi Khoi groups. And uh, recently we also studied this, and we find actually that this was a male biased migration from East Africa into Southern Africa that introduced uh, pastoralism practices. So um, this is an X to autosome ratio where we use uh, the X chromosome compared to the autosomes to calculate whether there's a sex bias uh, admixture into populations. And here we can see that the East African component in Khoi Khoi individuals uh, have a, a big sex bias uh, towards male contributions, even more so um, than the colonial times introduced into this population um, when Europe, there was a strong sex bias towards European males marrying uh, local females. So quite strong sex bias for this East African uh, migration of herders into Southern Africa as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about this study, but we had a recent study uh, of, uh, of populations in the Sahel and Savannah belt. Um, and what we see is that there are these bi-directional migrations in the Sahel belt, but you're welcome to look at this paper that we published recently. Uh, the last one I want to quickly mention is the Bantu expansion, which is one of the largest Holocene expansion events. Um, and it's already now for a long time, over a, a decade known that this Bantu expansion was a demic expansion, meaning um, that together with the culture and language, um, there was expansion of people. So it's not just language or culture that moves um, through populations, it was really a group of people that moved across the landscape, taking with them their language and their culture, their farming culture in this case. Um, and we know that Bantu expansion was this uh, demic expansion of people. But more and more, we are realizing that the Bantu expansion might have been a complex expansion and there might have been what people call spread over spread events. Because um, just looking at the archaeological data, we see evidences in certain areas of uh, occupation. And then we have where there's no occupation of the area. And then we have reoccupation of the area 
by new groups. So it seems that the Bantu expansion was not just one event of a group expanding and moving to a different place, but it was actually different groups that uh, sort of expanded across each other um, that in the end formed the Bantu expansion. We also had a recent study looking at South African Bantu speaking groups. And again, using principal component analysis, we see complex genetic structure. Um, and we see that it correlates in South African Bantu speaker groups, it correlates with geography. And we see a correlation between two dimensional genetic space and geography. And we also see a correspondence between language uh, structure and also genetic structure. But what is very interesting when we look at current day South African variation and we plot ancient DNA individuals uh, that come from the same geographic area by different time periods, uh, we see that these ancient DNA individuals group with different South African groups. And uh, the individuals that, that are older or living uh, more, more distant in time group, for instance, here with Tsonga populations and uh, populate or, or individuals that lived more recent in time based on carbon dating, um, they group were from Guni groups like the Zulu and Koza, indicating that the Tsonga might have been an earlier migration into Southern Africa uh, than uh, the Zulu and Koza groups or the Nguni migrations into Southern Africa. Um, but we are just at the starting stage with, with generating ancient DNA uh, for African populations. So as we generate more uh, genetic data from the different populations, um, these patterns will become clearer and clearer. Just to summarize uh, the few things um, that I talked about today. So deep human history uh, probably is very complex in Africa and it's not a simple tree, but it's more like this river delta network of population splitting and merging in time. So we need these different, to test these different models and to see which of these models actually represents uh, our deep history in Africa. And then also the farming and Holocene's expansions in Africa were probably quite complex and ancient DNA will also help us to resolve this complexity. Uh, I just want to thank um, our South African col collaborators at the City Brenner Institute, also Imla Sudial and Marlies Lombard that collaborated with modern day and ancient DNA studies, uh, and also my group in Uppsala University, uh, together with the different agencies that support us and the different fun funding uh, associations. Thank you very much. <laughs>